Hi everyone, I'm Toluca from Markers and Minions. And the topic of this evening's live video is going to be all about assessment. So the reason why I decided to talk about assessment is because this is a hot topic in our group. This is something that comes up very often and there's usually a lot of um, confusion and concern around the assessment component of our program. Um, specifically the different types and then how to best use them. Um, so we'll, we'll go over all of the different types of options that you have for assessing, um, test taking strategies for your students, um, and test taking strategies for you or test teaching strategies for you. Um, online versus paper, that's something that comes up quite a bit. How to use the data, how to create class goals with the data, and then how to commu communicate with parents um, on this topic of assessment and our standards, you know, standards-based grading practices. Hello, welcome people who are joining in. Um, so those are our main goals for today, for tonight's discussion. Um, I do have different links and videos and resources that I've put together for tonight's topic. And I will link them in the comments as we go along. And then also I'm going to be adding this to our units. So if for anyone who hasn't noticed yet, in our little left-hand navigation bar in our group, there's an option now that says units. If you click on that, you'll have different, um, like, I guess, lessons, you could say, that I put there. And each each one is a different topic. So we're going to have a unit all around assessment where I will just throw all of these links and resources that we talk about this evening. So that way, you can come back to it and find it all in one place. Hi, Carol. Hi, everybody. Hey, Barb. And so Barb, actually, she's the one that um, convinced me uh, or talked to me about this topic um, a couple days ago and this video I think will help beginners and then as we start talking about how to use the data and getting into all of that that will be for people who are um, already comfortable with assessments so I'm gonna cover like a range of of um, levels today so just take what you need for now you can always come back to this later as you're getting more familiar with the program all right so I'm gonna start different assessment options there are a ton now um, there are versions that come in a in your handbook in different handbooks and then all of that is accessible online as well um, I created quick little videos of how to access many of these assessments online. So I will be posting those afterwards and you'll see. But all of these things that I'm talking about are going to be in different assessment handbooks that came in your giant pile of curriculum. So the first one is the um, K through 6 foundational skills. So that's for every grade level, it's all one handbook, and it assesses just your basic foundational skills. Um, I pulled a few of the things from this book, and I printed them. There's so much, I couldn't print it all, but um, I pulled some of it to just kind of get you familiar with what's in there. Um, we've got oral reading fluency quick checks. So these are your quick checks that you're going to use that uh, are leveled. So they're A through Z. This one's level N. So this is the beginning of third grade. So this is a good screener for the very beginning um, to assess the fluency. And then down here, like, you know, the phrasing, intonation, and then comprehension. Very basic questions. So with this, you would pull the level you want. And um, all of the levels are easily easy to print out off the website. And you start, you can start with like the beginning of your, the beginning of your grades letter correlation and um, then give the running record and then if the student passes, then go to the next one. So I would go to O. If it's too hard, I would stay and maybe even go back to M. So you want to find their um, instructional reading level basically. 
um, and we'll talk about how to use this later. So this is this teacher page here. This is where you would record as the students are reading this page. This is the rainbow mailbox. Um, there are also different versions of level N, like for third grade, for example, there are several stories that you can read for level N. This one, I think, is the hardest one for my kids. I think it was this one. Yeah, because there's a lot of dialogue in it. So this one's a good one for me. And then this is the self-check. So these are the, the students' questions. And normally, I will just print this back to back, laminate it, and that's it. So I recommend printing off, like, the levels for your grade level, for your grade, and then a few below, a few above, just laminating them and having them on hand for your students to read off of. Um, so these go together. And then you've got your correlation here. So what these letters mean, if this is unfamiliar to anybody. Also what the um, words per minute is, is what the goal is for that level. And then you've got like rubrics, so how to score the phrasing, intonation, fluency, whatnot. That's all there. Um, these reading passages, these quick checks, start at level D. So A, B, and C are also going to be found online but in a different tab. And they are these screeners. So you've got everything, letter recognition, sounds, all of that. Um, A, B, and C. So that's for primary folks. Okay, so that is the foundational skills book. And that's gonna have like a navy blue cover for everybody. That doesn't, the color doesn't change depending on grade level, just cause it's K through six. Hmm, we've also got the informal assessments um, handbook online as well. And that's gonna have like, all your observation checklists, um, reading ch uh, checklists, so like when you're when you're listening to students read, things that you can fill out, uh, something that you can fill out when you're doing your guided reading for each student, um, writing checklists, tons of masters in there that are useful. Um, let me pause for just a moment. Hi, Kathleen. Hello. How do you know which grade level is which level? Um, so there's that chart here. Like I said, it starts at D, um, which is first grade, apparently. And then um, they, they span. So like M is the end of second grade. So when my students come in, like ideally they're at like MN, the beginning of third. Um, and then uh, usually every grade is like about three letters. Some of them are more, like first grade's more. And then um, they also have, Benchmark also has a correlation conversion chart online that shows what the letter is, what the Lexile is, AR, I believe. So all of the different reading levels matched up. Okay, Christine says, are we supposed to do the fluency assessment the first 20 days of school? That depends on your district and really what you want to do. Um, when I was with LAUSD way back when, we didn't have benchmark yet, but we used this um, the same system. We used Scholastic A to Z or Fountas Pinal, something like that, where we had to constantly assess. So we did this, this same exact thing, this running record, and we had to do it every six weeks. So we did that for our universal access time where we grouped our kids. Um, in my current district, what we're doing, what we did last year was we had to just do, we did it, I think, three times throughout the year. So in the beginning, we just did N, and it was more like a pass or fail kind of thing. We didn't have to keep going forward or go lower. Um, and then in the beginning of the year, O, and end of the year, P, I think we did it three times. And then we just submitted that data to the district. Um, but it really depends on what your district needs from you and then how you want to use the data. So if you, we'll talk about this more, if you want to group your guided reading groups based off of this, you're going to want to reassess pretty often, probably every like six to eight weeks. 
Um, and then that's a whole challenge in itself. It's like, well, what are my kids doing while I'm assessing? Because if you're going above the level, if they keep passing, they're flying through levels, it takes a really long time. And it has to be one-on-one. -on -one. Mm. So Kathleen, I don't know, does this have pages? Yeah, these have page numbers. I just printed out random pages. Um, these are like 193, 168, but it's all organized very well online. Um, and like I said, as soon as this is done, I will be uploading those quick videos. Each one's like a minute on how to find each of these components. And then once you see what it looks like online, you'll be able to, I don't have physical versions with me, but you'll be able to see like, oh, that's this book. Andrea, the conversion chart, the alignment chart is under program support. I feel like I need a video. This is inspiring me. I feel like I need a video just on the program support tab. There's everything there. Hi, Tina. Benchmark buddies. <laughs> All right. Um, so your foundational skills, your informal. Okay, and then you've got your, let's talk about interims. There are three, four interim tests. I think online it shows three. Interim one, interim two, and interim three. Now interim one tests the students on end of the year standards. That's what you are going to want to give the first few days of school. Don't teach them anything yet. Give, them to, give it to them. Let them know like this, this is only for the purpose of gauging your growth this year. So I, you can even say, like, I expect this to be really foreign to you. I expect you to not know any of these answers. Don't worry about it. Just, just take it. Um, and then I have them do that paper pencil. And then we transferred. I can't remember. No, our district had us do it just on the computer. Um, so it took forever. Sorry, my Alexa signal word is so she's listening to me. Um, so we had them take it online, took forever, but it was worth it. So that interim one, end of the year standards, have them take it right away, no pressure. Interim two is assessing them on units one through three. So take that right around the time you finish unit three. Like for us, I think that was November. So right before our first reporting period. Um, interim three, the next one, is units one through six. So take that around after you finish unit six. And then finally, interim four, at the very end of the year, you assign interim one again, that one that assessed end of year standards. You give them that exact same test. And then you'll be able to see not only the growth every three units, but you'll be able to see from the beginning of the year to the very end of the year. And it's wonderful. So even if your district doesn't require it, I recommend doing it just for yourself so that you can um, communicate the growth to your parents and then so that you kind of know where your class is headed. So those are your interims. Uh, we've also got the weeklies and the units. So the weekly assessments, I printed one out for third grade. Um, the weekly assessments are weeks one and weeks two. And they are about 10 questions each. So this one ends on question seven. But there's like, you know, part A, part B. So they're all around 10 questions. They're pretty short. In the beginning of the year, these are going to take a while. And um, I will explain how I give these in the beginning of the year and how I use a gradual release model. This is totally going to be depending on you and your class and your, your style and your district and whatever, but this is what I do. Um, in the beginning, and I, I never skip these weeklies, I always make time for them. They, they get a lot quicker. In the beginning, I will read everything to my students. So, I will read the passage, I'll model metacognitive strategies as I'm reading. I'll even come upon something like this and say, oh, this is a graphic feature called a map. And this is a map of the Port of Baltimore 
And as we can see, we can see the Harbor Place, the aquarium. Oh, look, here's a compass, north, south, west, and east. This is called a caption. This tells us more about our graphic feature. So I'll do all that. It's a total teaching tool. And then I get to question number one. And I say, we're going to be seeing a lot of test questions that have a part A and a part B. So this, this question, this part B, is going to depend on what you choose for part A. These go together. They're married. Two and one. Part A says, what is the main idea of this passage? Well, remember when we had our mini lesson on the main idea, blah, 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 right? A, the people of Baltimore care about their harbor. Yes, maybe. School children in Baltimore paint colorful murals. No, it wasn't about that at all. I'm going to cross that out. I'm going to throw it out. Some people throw trash on the streets and sidewalks. It did mention that, but it's not what the whole thing is about. I'm going to cross that out. And then D, people in Baltimore are working to clean up their harbor. Yes. So then I'll go on to explain that. Letter A, the people of Baltimore care about their harbor, is like the pothole question that's trying to trip them. Um, there's always going to be two throwaways, for the most part, two throwaways, and then one that's a good answer, and then there's one that's the best answer. So then I'll say, okay, this one was D. And then part B, choose one sentence from the passage that supports the main idea in part A. So we have to find one of these details from this, this story from the text, rather, that supports this idea that people in Baltimore are working to clean up their harbor. So the city of Baltimore has a great harbor. Maybe. That's why Baltimore has started the Healthy Harbor Project. I think that's the one. As water flows down the streets, it picks up trash. No, that's not what the whole thing's about. It reminds everyone to put trash where it belongs. No. I think B is the best answer. I think that supports D, my main idea. So I go through each question. I model how to take it. This one, I didn't really need to go back to the text, but like for the next one, for example, what is the meaning of the word debris in paragraph two? I'll say, boys and girls, this is a context clue. So you're not going to know what this, this um, test, this question is asking you to do unless you go back to paragraph two and figure, find that word and figure out what it means. So then I'll model going back to paragraph two, reading the whole section here, circling the word debris, right? And then finding other words in here that give us a clue as to what debris means. Then I'll say, okay, so now you're gonna go back to number two. And I always explain that like while they're taking a test, I want to see them flipping through. Um, so anyway, unit one, I do it like that. So that's what takes forever. Um, and I do that for all three tests. The unit assessment, which is week three, is the one that's very long. Um, I do print it off for the students, at least in the beginning of the year. And uh, I give it to them in chunks. And again, it's like a teaching, teaching tool. Um, once I get to unit two, I will read the passage and I will read the questions, but I will not answer them. I will not show them the strategies. And then this past year, by the time I got to unit three, I was able to just hand them the test. And they did it all by themselves. So um, something that I've communicated over and over again in this group is if you use that strategy, this, this approach of gradual release with these tests, it'll really set your students up for success. But obviously, you're not assessing in the very beginning. Or even like when I said I got to unit two and I would read the passage, that's not really a reading comprehension test, right? So you're not going to get that much data from the first trimester, really. So you'll have to rely on things like this, these little assessments. We also use Luxile. Maybe you might use AR, things like that. Um, so that's how I do those. Now, that's the, those are the strategies. Towards the end of the year, and I, I've done a video on this before, and this would be for my, my, my students, my teachers in this group who are comfortable with these assessments. You've probably you know, you've done it a year or so already. What you can really work on this next year with your students, since they're pretty familiar with the strategies for 
you know, going back and finding text evidence and annotating and whatnot, is you can really focus on teaching them to internalize the standards. So really it's like nine standards, nine reading standards, um, because that tenth one is just read complex text at grade level. Um, so, you know, teach them. The first standard is going to be finding text evidence. So that's going to be one where you might need to go back to the, te the text to find the answer. Um, point two is main idea and key details. Oh look, this is asking you to do reading standard point two. Um, this one's context clues, which is point four, determine the meaning of, of unfamiliar words. So that's something that you might do um, in year two or something, my year one folks, something that you might start to do towards the end of the year. And that was really helpful for my students because they were able to start connecting the purpose of my mini lessons to the test. So when I would say like, okay, now we're doing a key details and main idea lesson. Remember, this is our point two standard. What does that look like on the test? Well, here are some key words and you've done this strategy with me before in whole group and in small group. So they're able to make those connections a little bit better. Um, okay, I also, if you're interested in, in doing the interims, those, uh, that interim one where it tests the end of the year standards, I have a video that I filmed at the end of last year where I broke it down and analyzed it by standard so that you can really see like the what kind of words I use to communicate the learning goals to my students and then like where they're expected to go and how heavily each standard is represented. Um, okay, let's see. Do you happen to know how well do these fluency compare to the California Reading and Literature Project and Dibbles? I don't know the CRLP. Um, Dibbles, I think it's like when I when we did Dibbles with LUSD, we also did the, the TRC. This kind of reminds me of the TRC. Um, so Dibbles is more of is fluency, right? If I'm remembering on the iPads. So it's how many miscues, self-corrects, it's kind of the same thing. So you might like in the beginning of the year that you might rely on your Dibbles scores to help you with your assessment. Um, so the alignment chart can only be found online. My district hasn't set up our online accounts yet. And it's probably in one of the handbooks. I can take a screenshot for you, Andrea. Let me write that down. Screenshot. If you also if you Google it, it should come up. Alignment chart for Andrea. Okay. Hi Pamela. Hi Laura. Are the interims given completely independently? Yes, because like I said, interim one and between teacher to teacher, like you want them to bomb it. So interim one, just give it to them. Say, this is just a test growth. You're not going to know anything on this. You're it's totally okay if you don't know the answer. Do your best guess. Um, and then they don't do so well typically and then when they take the other interims and then when they get to that last interim which is a repeat of the beginning of the year you're gonna be like ah and it's all independent so it's true true assessment do you structure your lessons so the weekly assessments are on Fridays yeah I do Um, and in the beginning of the year, like you're going to have, something's going to have to give probably. So on Fridays, you might, you know, skip your small groups or whatever. It's up to you. But it's, it takes a while in the beginning of the year for these kids to get used to these assessments. <laughs> Do you ever disagree with the answer key? more than one possible answer choice would be acceptable. <laughs> yes. I myself have gotten better at taking these tests, to be honest. But there have been plenty of times, like in this group, and then even when I'm sitting down with my partner teacher, where we're like, this is stumping me. It could be more than one for sure. But then I just I just think, tell myself, okay, well, what's the pothole? Because there's going to be one that's 
very close, but not the best answer. Tina, do you find that the tests get harder? I've talked to a couple teachers and they're starting with unit three or four because they're fun. <laughs> I'm starting with one because although it's not fun, it's good for practice. I don't count scores for unit one. What do you think? Yeah, the tests do. Like just, I so printing this out for today's video, I was reading through it. Listen to this. For, I mean, I don't know if you guys would know, but they're great. The city of Baltimore has a great harbor, but it has some problems. It is dirty. There is trash floating in the water. Like super simple sentences. They do get more complex for sure. Um, and also the, the, um, the way that the skills, so our skills spiral in our program, right? And the way that they're taught change throughout the program. So in unit one, there's a lot of modeling, a lot of metacognition, like having the kids listening, listen to your thinking aloud. By the time you get to the middle of the year around unit five, there's a lot more put on to the student and their partner, partner work, collaborative stuff. And then towards the end of the, the year, those later units, there's a lot of a lot more independent work. So um, I hear I, I know a lot of teachers like to switch units around, but I would say that like if you flip like units that are back to back, like one and two, fine. Um, but like flipping one and four, one and like some people even like one and nine because they want to bring in that science, like the lessons are going to be different. Um, it's based off of the John Hattie surface deep transfer. Is that gradual? Alignment chart is in the foundational skills printed book. Thank you, Kathleen. Do you do the first 20 days and unit one at the same time? No. Your review and routines days are separate. Did you hear naughty to flip? What, Christine? I don't know what that means. Okay. Um, let's see. So those are the types of assessments. Now, online versus paper. This is something that comes up a lot as well. Um, I personally like to have my kids take it paper pencil because I want to see this. All right, we're teaching them to annotate all day long every day. We need to annotate. Um, and, and some tests I even say like, okay, annotation is going to be plus one. Like if you don't annotate, if I don't see this marked up, you're going to get a plus zero. So I'll even add on a point for annotating sometimes um, if, when the kids start getting a little lazy. So I like to have them do it on paper, and then they will log on and they'll take it online. But that takes two seconds because they're just saying, oh, number one was D, okay. And then they put it online, on the online test. Part B was B, okay. And then they just go through it in like five minutes. They log off and then um, and the way that I manage that is like I have them doing it in the background while I'm teaching a whole class lesson. So I'll take all of the tests from like the Friday before or, or the, the before recess, whenever it was, I'll put them at our computer. We have two computers. We'll put, I'll put it on the table. And then whoever's at the top of the stack, they come first, those first two. And then when they're done, they take their physical tests, go put it on my desk. And then whoever they see is next, they have to quietly go and get that next person and tell them to log on. And that's it. So it probably takes like half an hour for everyone to do it. No, it's got to be more than that. I don't know. It's in the background, and it's quick. So um, that's how I do it. And then, uh, but some people like to do it just online. Um, I feel that my kids score better when it's on paper first. Um, but that's not to say that you should never do them online, because when they take them online, you're able to get so much data. I know some teachers, I've heard, they, they will actually, when they're scoring paper pencil, they will look at the answer key to see what standard was being assessed. And then they'll look at several tests and try to put pieces together. Like, oh, Johnny really struggles with context clues on because of this test, this test, this test, and this test. And then when I say, hey, the online component does it for you, it like blows their mind. So you don't have to do any of that grunt work. So that's the benefit of doing it online.
Oh, did you hear? Naughty to flip. Yeah, naughty to flip the units. <laughs> we have teachers who do not go in order. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, we do what we do, right? What if we switch answers from paper? What if they switch answers from paper to computer? Then it's a learning experience. <laughs> um, at the end, also, when they're done, all the scores are submitted, I will print off the report that has the. Um, like what they answered, what was the correct answer, and then it breaks it down by standard. And so it'll say like RI 3.1, it'll say this was questions one, five, nine, whatever, and then it'll say you scored 75% on that. So it breaks it down by percentage for each standard. I'll staple that, it's just one page, I'll staple that to the paper version of the test, and then I teach kids how to analyze it, and they love it. So they'll compare their answers, and I say, okay, go back. I want you to actually read that question and see what was it, why did you get it wrong, and, and try to make sense of the correct answer that it's giving you. And, um, and then I also, We'll send this home to parents so that they can get an idea of how their students, how their kids doing. Um, sometimes if we don't have time to analyze in class, which a lot of the times we don't, I'll say analyze for homework with your parents. Go over your score, compare it, and then bring it back on Monday and you'll get a class dollar or whatever. And then it's a good way to keep the parents informed as well. So that brings me to how to use the data. So that's one way I use that data is so that my students are able to analyze and really see what their strengths and their weaknesses are. And we actually do something called class goals. And I uploaded it to my TPT, it's a free download, here we go. It's just a little template that I made, like half sheet of paper, it says, my reading goal, and then it says standard that I want to focus on. There's space to write the standard. What specific reading strategy do I, it's tiny, do I need to improve? And they have to write a little reflection based on the data. And then what can I do to get better at this? Something like that. So it's a quick little template. There it is, linked in the comments. Um, and I like doing that just so that they're on top of themselves and they're able to, again, internalize the, the standards so that they know exactly what's expected to, of them. And like I said, it's really nine. And it doesn't really matter if it's literature or informational because, you know, 3.2 in literature is going to be find the themes, the morals. And then 3.2 in informational is going to be find the main idea. So it's the same strategy, just different type of text. And once the kids understand that and really see that there's not that many, then they can really like focus on just one or one or two. I'll have them do individual goals every like trimester. Like don't get too crazy with it. But every trimester, just pull them up to your computer, show them the results, the different data that comes up from the tests. And just say, like, look, you you score, like, 50% in, you know, 0.8, that, that sequencing one. So what do you need to do? Oh, I need to work on finding the signal words in the text or whatever and the quick reflection. And um, then we'll do, like, a class goal as well. And this was this is helpful to me as well because – um, those of you who have been following me for a while, you know that I pull, I do voc context clues every week, regardless of if there's a, an explicit vocabulary lesson or not. I make time for um, going over unfamiliar words in these texts and figuring out the meaning of them using context clues. That's like my big thing. Um, and so after, I think it was after like our interim test in March, interim three, I think. As a class, I pulled up the overall summary. We went over it on the overhead. As a class, for context clues, they scored like in the 80% range. So I said, okay, now you know what I'm gonna take out of my week? Context clues. So it kind of helps you customize what you need to teach also. Um, so that's the way to use the data from these assessments. These assessments where you're pulling, where you're assessing for their independent reading level and their instructional reading level, these are helpful for determining or making up your guided reading groups. 
Now, um, the difference between independent and instructional. An independent reading level would be if they are able to, you know, fly through this in a minute, very little miscues, great comprehension, like that's an easy text for them. That's their independent level. That's what they can read in their, in their, on their own, um, if you're into that. Uh, there's also the instructional, meaning it's not frustration. They didn't totally bomb it, but they like, they didn't do well enough to go on to the next level. So either they've, I don't know, like it's look at the rubric, but if say they got like two comprehension questions wrong and they like scored, they did 80 words per minute instead of a hundred, like, okay. Um, so you're going to find that level that comes right before um, like frustration. Does that make sense? Um, and then that's what you're going to be, grouping your students on when they're doing their guided reading with you. Um, we also in my district use Lexile. So that is a lot easier than these because the computer generates the Lexile level for us. And I'll group kids based on that Lexile score and then read a leveled reader that's around that, like a little bit higher because they're with me. And it's, it's complex, but I'm there. So that's how you, that's one way to determine your guided, what, uh, what students to pull for your guided reading groups is like the A through Z level or the Lexile. Um, you can also make groupings based on like need, needs around standards or strategies, which again, you can get all of that information online. Here's a link that I have. This is a video. It's 10 minutes. It shows all the different reports. So if you want to find um, exactly like how your students are doing on a specific standard and then group your kids on that or like on that need and you can do that too. It's a lot of options. You would start analyzing data unit when, unit when, sending computer printouts home when because they're helping them so, we're helping them so much in the beginning. As soon as it becomes independent. So for me, that was around unit three when I was able to just give it to them. Um, you could even, I mean, you could even start in unit two, but like I said, it's, or, you know, unit two for me. Whenever you're at that point where like you're reading the passage, but you're not finding the answers for them and they're finding the answers, you could start even analyzing then. Um, just so the kids start internalizing their objectives and goals for the year. But um, yeah, once you get to the, like the full, fully independent, which like might not, might never be right in the primary grades. It's just, I think it's up to you. This is my first year with benchmark. Are interim tests only online or can I find the test in one of the books? There's a, a book called the interim and performance tasks tests so you can find a hard copy as well and the performance tasks I forgot to talk about those we didn't do those the last year um, we our district required it the first year we did benchmarks so two years ago we did the performance task in the middle of the year after unit five and I think it was instead of interim three yeah I think so and it was on like they had to read about Ben Franklin and then it was like written, written responses, like the SPEC. Should we give those if we're giving the TRC? And if so, how often? Well, I think you can make your groupings based off of your TRC, Trina. Like, I think I would be able to make my leveled groups for guided reading based off of the data from TRC or, or even Dibbles. Again, it kind of goes back to what your district requires. Hi, Jess. Let me on the hard copy. Yeah. Um, the interim tests are also available in print. Yes. My district hasn't given us access to the online materials. I'm hoping there's a master to copy. Yes. There is. Okay. Um, where am I? 
So looking at my outline, I went over online versus paper. Are there any questions about that? Like on, like should they take it online versus on paper? Or even like, are there any questions about the gradual release? Um, there are so many great ideas that come up in this group around giving these assessments. Um, and like I said, do what, at the end of the day, what's what's best for you, it's gonna be the most useful for you, and then what your district requires. Because it's totally different. So if you put a post out there, you're gonna get a lot of different opinions and strategies, but really you have to, you have to see what's required of you. Um, but to hear what other people do, or see what other people do rather, use the search tool in the in the group. Um, there's there's a little um, magnifying glass with a little bar to so search this group. Just type assessment, and so much information will come up from the past year. You'll see a lot of other like great ideas that other people do. Valerie, the TRC is a like it's uh it's on the iPad. It's a way to assess fluency, literal and, and inferential comprehension, um, accuracy. We um and when I did it with LUSD, I think it wasn't every school. We were a pilot school when I was with LUSD. We were a pilot public choice school. So we had like all these extra things that that other schools didn't have. But we did Dibbles and TRC, and I remember them being super similar. TRC, I think, was a little harder. Did you tell parents to expect beginning of year scores would be lower than they are used to? Year? Yeah, and that is um, the next item on today's agenda is how to communicate with parents. Okay. First of all, you have to communicate with your students, too. So who is a rug in their classroom? I have this big rug where I do my whole group time. And I stood at the top of my rug, the kids facing me. I stood on one end and I said, this is where we are in the beginning of the year right now. And then I walked to the other end of my rug and I said, this is the end of the year, third grade, um, where you need to be, right? So that visual there. Then I explained one through four because we do standards-based grades. A one means that you're, you're not really even showing growth, you're not headed in the right direction just yet. Every step that you take from this point to this point of the rug is a two. And then I say, are you going in the right direction? Yes. Are you showing progress? Yes. Is this a good place to be? Yes. Are you going to get discouraged when you get a two? No. Okay. So you're going to get a lot of twos this year. Once you get to the end of the rug, and then this is where it becomes different based on teacher or district, whatever. Once you get to the end of the rug, that's a three. Like you've met your, your standards for the year. Are some of us going to get there quicker than others? Yes. But if you're not there by the middle of the year, are you going to stress? No. So that's how I, I explain the one and the two and the three. I know some teachers just like, a four is you've met your grade level expectations. But for me, it's really one, two, three, and then four would be exceeding. Um, so I communicate that with the students first and I let them know two is okay. And then I've got two parent letters that I send out, both of which I put in this download for you. Let me link it here, free of course. On my TPT, um, when you open it up, it'll be a link to my Google Drive, and then you can edit, customize it however you want. It's on Google Docs. But it says, let me pull it up. The first, there's two. One's for the beginning of the year, one's for like around reporting period. I think this first letter is going to be helpful for my year ones. Where there's the new curriculum all together. Okay, I'm downloading my my link. Sorry, I should have had this pulled up. Just 
Go make a copy. It's going to prompt you to make a copy when you download the TPT link so that it saves automatically to your drive and so that it doesn't edit my original. So once you click make a copy, it will open. And the first one says Hello, parents. I'd like to share some information about our language arts tests that we have started taking. Our reading program consists of weekly and unit tests. These tests have complex reading passages designed to match the rigor of the California State Test, and the questions are challenging. I've spent time walking th through the tests with the students, and I've modeled my strategies for solving the questions by thinking aloud. But even with this practice, I don't expect mastery on these tests just yet. When I send them home and you review them with your child, please don't get discouraged. Remind your children that they are making progress, and that's what matters. They're doing a great job, and I see how hard they try and how much they love to learn. Lastly, please note that report card grades are not based on these tests alone for me. I also look at SRI reading levels, so like the Lexile levels I was talking about, written responses, informal observation, through class discussions. And that's where you would say, like, don't worry, like, these tests aren't everything. This is what I also look at. Now, the second letter in here is a letter to the parents regarding standards-based grading and report cards. With report cards being finalized, I realize that a standards-based grading scale of one to four can be vague. I want to email you all with some information specifically about our language arts standards, our test score data, and how this translates to our report cards. Um, blah, 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 what the kids need to learn in third grade. And then I break it down into foundational reading, informational literature, writing to sources, and language. How we teach the standards and evaluate the kids. Oh my god, this is a long letter. Um, anyway, so I go into like the language arts skills spiral. Mastery is not expected until the end of the year. Um, in terms of like what that looks on the grading scale, one means they would they have not been picking up the skills. That's a nice way to put it. Two would mean they're not they're working their way through the year, picking up skills here and there at different times as exposure is repeated. And a three would mean they have a, the skill mastered after months and months. So it breaks it down. And then I go into how our class is doing, and then I show parents. Um, the data from interim one and interim two, interim three, or however many interims you've taken at that point. You can do a class summary, and um, it shows it in terms of, like, colors. So um, you, you will see growth, I promise. You'll see, like, in the beginning of the year, interim one, there's a lot of red. And then as you go on and on, that red shrinks. And then I talk about with the parents, like, look at the red and the orange column shrinking. That's what I want you to focus on. So in sum, if you see a child, a two on your child's report card, don't get discouraged. They're working their way through the skills and making progress. So that's something that you can use. And that is totally editable for you. Um, and then I think that's really important to establish, like now, even like when you have back to school night, you're getting to know your parents. Let them know that that it's okay, it's gonna be a struggle, and it's a good struggle. This is making so much more sense now, I wish I found this group earlier. <laughs> um, I'm teaching second grade, would you recommend, recommend giving the screeners, or just start with a level text? So the way that you determine what level text to use with your students is based on what they, how they perform on the screener. So whether you're using these screeners or you're finding their A to Z reading level and grouping them by similar letter, that's one way to do it. You can do it by your Lexile. Um, whatever way your district determines reading level, that's how you're going to group them. And then that's how you, you decide what level text you're going to use when you sit down with those kiddos. Do you print out assessments the whole year or eventually just online? I print it all year. I kept saying last year, like, eventually it's just going to be online because I want to get my kids ready for us back. And then after a while, I was like, you know what? I don't care. Like, what's more important to me is these. This tells me how I'm doing as a teacher more than the aspect does. 
Um, so I, I printed it all year long. Mm. You're welcome, guys. What exactly are the screeners called? Um, there are a ton of different screeners. So um, it's all there. The screeners are all under K through six foundational skills in that handbook or online. Um, these ones are called the quick checks. That's just what I call them. They're the one minute oral reading fluency quick checks. There's, there are even screeners for like, do you know your syllables? Do you know your consonants? Like everything. Um, all found in that handbook. I'm heading into year two. Any big pointers for getting through it all? I edited quite a bit and still only made it to unit seven. <laughs> right there with you, Harry. I made it to unit eight. <laughs> but I will say that by the time you get to unit seven, you've covered all your standards. So at least there's that. You're welcome, Sherry. I mean, Shelly. Okay, guys. So in sum, um, you there's a lot of different ways to assess. There's more than you need, probably. Um, the the goal, main goals are get your kids level so that you can get that precious guided reading time with them, and then also get them used to like the rigor the types of questions, and then you get used to really looking at that data and having that determine where you'd like to go with your planning. And I promise you will see growth. Um, we went up 10% with every interim. Beginning of the year, my students scored an average of 45%. At the end of the year, they scored 75%. So, and it was, yeah, one to two was 10%. Two to three, ten percent. Three to four, ten percent. You will see growth. Don't be worried. Um, I joined very late. Where do I access your letter? It's on my TPT. Um, everything that I'm linking, all these videos, tutorials, um, how to find the data online, how to find these tests, these screeners online, the parent letter, the reading goals template, I will put under the unit in our Facebook group. So like I said, check out that units tab. We're not using a standards-based report card. What are your thoughts on grading? Is it fair to grade 90 to 100 scale at the beginning of the year? Elsa, I don't even know. I'm sorry. I don't know. But anyone else who hasn't switched to standards-based report card, how are you doing it? Um, that has come up, I know, in the past year. Not often, but that has come up, Elsa. So if you do the search this group, um, see what comes up. You're welcome, Barb. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, guys. All right. Um, let me know if you have any questions in the comments. Go ahead and um, keep posting. I will, I'm going out to dinner soon, but as soon as that's done, I'll revisit. I'll answer some of your questions in the comments so that people who don't make it through the whole video can at least scroll through that. And I will dump everything into that unit for you all. I hope this helps, and I hope that you had a wonderful week. See you soon. Bye.